should start EIB now. See guys, EIB um, is the first kind of integrations that uh, you would use, uh, you know, in any other organization. Now, why I said that this is the first type of, uh, you know, integration that you are going to use. EIB has a lot of things, you know, which no other integration can give it to you. So what is the speciality of EIB? EIB is called as Enterprise Interface Builder. Okay. Here, we can use the report that we converted into web services as a source of data and we can convert that and use it to send the data outside of the system okay now before we get into the actual eib let me explain to you during uh, i mean there are multiple type of integrations okay whatever the what are the other types of integrations so i'll start from the beginning so you have EIB inbound, you have got EIB outbound, okay? Then we have core connector. So there, core connector is maximum used for outbound. Uh, you'll rarely see using it for inbound, but yeah, it is used for outbound. Then you have um, studio, right? So that's the fourth type of integration, studio. Now, Studio, what happens is it's a plugin which is basically installed. Okay, a plugin which is basically installed on Eclipse. So, when we talk about Studio, right? So, Studio, uh, basically what happens is it's, it's a tool which is outside of the tenant. EIB, Core Connector, whatever we are going to build, that will be inside the tenant, the Workday tenant. But when you use uh, Studio, right, it is a tool which is outside of the Workday tenant. You don't need uh, the tenant directly, uh, you know, um, to use Workday Studio. So once that installation is done on Eclipse, you are good to basically start the development. So here, uh, you know, you will use just like pictorial representation, how you build the flow charts and everything, right? So you will uh, put that as a flow chart, but in order to connect, in order to put the logics, you will have to write the code. And what code or languages are used in this? You have XML, XSLT, a little bit of Java so that you can make your or you can put the uh, logics correctly so that is how your studio works and then we have um, soap api and rest api integrations guys soap api and rest api integrations they are completely outside of workday studio itself you know at least you were able to connect uh, you know, using the web services or token system, you were able to connect the system. But when you use SOAP and REST API, it is not even used in a tool. You can use Notepad to write your own code. So when I say Notepad, which means it's a completely hardcore pro programming. You may be aware about any particular coding language such as Java then how can you uh, set up a code which will basically help you connect to the system. So that is where your SOAP API comes into picture and similarly your REST API comes into picture. So these are the six types of integrations that we have guys. Out of that, as I stated, 25% of the you know uh, integrations in your day-to-day -day activity would be done through EIB. That is through, um, you know, uh, EIP inbound or outbound and 60 to 65% of the integration will be done by core connector. 
So that comes approximately 85 to 90 percent. Remaining 10 percent, which is very complex and, you know, which cannot be achieved through EIB and core connector. For those, you build studio integrations. And even if, you know, there are things which cannot be achieved through studio, then you will have SOAP and REST API. Okay. So all these things, I'm going to share a PPT with you. This PPT will contain all this information and uh, uh, you will get along with that core connector documents and then calculated field documents, everything you're going to get, okay? I mean, it was not uploaded yesterday, but today definitely it will be uploaded. Okay, so this is, this is what I wanted to discuss. And now we are going directly into core, uh, sorry, uh, EIB, not the core connector. All right, now the task to create the things, how do we actually act create the integrations, right? So that's very easy. How? We'll type the task here, which is called as create EIB. Okay, so this is my task. And then you see, start creating your EIB by giving it a name and selecting its direction. Outbound EIBs export data from Workday to the external systems. Inbound EIBs import the data from external system to Workday. So this is the main I am going to go ahead and build a EIB. So I'll say something like this. So what I'm doing is WDI one underscore EIB underscore OP. I'm keeping such a name because I'll be able to remember, right? And I'm going to create an outbound EIB. Okay, so this is my outbound EIB. I'll go ahead and click on OK. So once I go ahead and click on OK, you know, it will be a more like a wizard. If you have installed a, you know, application that, okay, what you will do is you will click on uh, next, 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 and you will be able to move further, right? So I've got uh, the name and the ID. So if you see the name and the ID is almost the same. Why the name and the ID is, is almost the same? Because I've kept the name such a way that it is very unique. And Workday has given this ID. We have not created it. But if you want, you can edit it. That is what you can do. But we don't need to edit. We're just trying to create it. So we'll keep it like the way it is. And then we have the option. We'll click on next. So this is a text box where what you can do is you can put something like this. This EIB helps us to transmit the data to a third party, okay? Because it's outbound. Outbound, what does that mean? It will extract the data from Workday and send it to a third party, okay? So this is how it works. What is the use of this ID, Debasif? ID is a unique, um, you know, entity. So, for example, if I have to link something, okay, then this ID is going to help us. Are we using that going forward in building no we uh, are not going to use it but workday provides a unique identification okay that's the reason the id is generated here for anything that you create does that make sense or no it's not clear i mean i understood that this id was created by workday and to link something, it is used. Uh, and that linking, who is doing it? Are we doing it while uh, developing this EIB or something no, internally? No no. Happening? no, no, no. It happens internally. We don't do it. And another thing is, 
this id uh, is is a unique thing for workday to keep it you know uh, internally safe that's the only thing you can understand take it in that way because when we will be building the integration nowhere we are going to use an id okay does that make sense already we have a unique name right why again unique id this is workday how they want to build it okay? okay again we are not controlling it because this field is not generated by us right okay all right so the next thing is how do you get that data So this is where your source will come. That from where you're going to get the data. So this is outbound. So when there is any outbound uh, integration, so what happens in outbound? Who can tell me? We extract data from Workday and send it to downstream not downstream we send it outside of workday yeah okay so now you see it says get data and it is asking you what is the source of your data okay data source type so there are two ways in which you can extract the data and if you remember i have explained it to you one is called as web service and another is called as custom report so here it is, web service and custom report. So I'll show you it with custom report because we have built an advanced report with web service. Inbound, I'll show you with web service, okay? Because there you can't use custom report. Now, any custom report will not work here. That means if if I'm trying to use any other custom, custom report, a simple report, a matrix report or inbox search report, no. It will only be a report which has web service enabled, which has the RAS enabled. If you don't have that enabled, you will not be able to find that report. So what did we create? WDI1, right? Can you search it? So this is the report that we have. And with this code, we have created multiple reports. We created simple also and the advanced also. But advanced with web services has only come here. If I'm trying to search, other reports would also come, right? But it is not coming. Why? Because here, only that report can come where web services are enabled. Does that make sense to all of you? Or is there a confusion in this step? Yes. yes. Clear, right? Okay. Now, we have selected the place from where we are going to get the data okay then what we'll do we'll click on next and then a transformation step will come now what is this transformation transformation is very very important part now why do we say very it is very very important because what workday does is internally workday converts this uh data that is there inside workday into a more transferable form transferable form means in which form you want to send that data it will be decided by workday we cannot go ahead and make anything here or make the changes here so what will happen here guys we will have to select a way in which you want to transform okay so if you see there are multiple options you will get like it is custom report transformation custom transformation and new custom report transformation so we have used a custom report now that custom report has never been used or has never been transformed earlier because this is the first time we are using it right we have just created it yesterday and today we are going to use it. 
Yes or no? Yes. Right. So we have never used that in any integration up till now. So for that purpose, we will use this option which says new custom report transformation. And once I select the new custom report transformation and I'll go ahead and click on next, then what will happen? It will convert that into the transferable form or we will not be able to see what format it is because it is hidden. But yeah, we will get the transformed file. So I'll show it to you. Apart from that, these two options are there, right? It says custom transformation and custom report transformation. Now, new custom report transformation basically helps us. New custom report transformation basically helps us to generate the transformation file for a new report which has never been transformed. When you talk about custom report transformation, which means there is already a file that is existing and we have used that in a previous integrations or we have convert that or transform that report so that you will not get this third option, which is new custom report transformation. Okay, then comes the option which says custom transformation. So here, basically we can put our own code. Own code means, suppose I am extracting the data from a custom object, okay? In that case, I want to put my own XSLT. I can do that, but you will rarely see anybody doing that in EIB, okay? Because Coding is generally not involved here, but Workday has given you the option. So what I'll do, I'll just use this option, which is new custom report transformation. And as soon as I'll click on next, there will be a transformation file that will automatically be coming up here. Right now it is empty. Okay, so I'll go ahead and click on next. Okay, it goes to the delivery, but I'll go back and then you will see this option. See this transformation is already done and that new custom transformation file is gone. New custom report transformation option is gone. Now why it is gone? Can anybody tell me? That's no more new. You already used it here. Yeah, we have already generated a transformation of this particular report. So it gets now onto this option, which is custom report transformation. And this file, which is the transformed file is here. Okay, clear to everybody? How the transformation works? Is there anybody who is not clear on this? Please tell me. Can you see the custom one? No, you can't. That is what I said, right? You, we don't know what is that format. And that's not accessible to us. We can't, we can view that. No, I was saying that there is three options, right? So the second option, can we see the custom, custom transformation? Here? Okay. So if you put a custom transformation, you have to put your own code here. That's what I'm saying. So we have to write the code outside and refer that yes. file. Yes. So you see, yeah. you have your XSLT code here, right? So you can put that XSLT code. So you have to okay. first upload it and then only it will come here. Okay. okay. So now when I choose custom report transformation, right? I will be able to see that data automatically. I mean to this say this file comes here automatically. Clear? Yep. Okay. Now I'll go ahead and click on next. Now you see this is very important part which is called as delivery. So up till now what we have done we have put the general parts like your name and ID of the outbound EIB. So whenever we talk about outbound, which means it is going to extract the data from Workday, 
and it is going to send to the third party. So first step, you have got the name. Second step, you have got the source from where I have to get that data, you know, from where we will extract it. Then the third step is to transform. So convert that into a form, convert that into a specific form that it can be easily transported on the web. That is the meaning of transformation. And now fourth step is to deliver. Where do you want to deliver the data? Now here, a lot of things depends upon your client or the customer or the vendor to whom you are sending the data. Why? Because they need to tell us where do they need the data? What kind of connections needs to be built? What is their server? where we have to send the data. Are they using FTP server? Are they using SFTP? Are they using uh, HTTP? Or are they using Amazon services, right? So whatever they are using, and those options are already there. So if you look into this, it says delivery method. So here you see Amazon Simple Storage Service, AS2, email, FTP, FTP SSL, HTTP SSL. SFTP, use existing delivery method and workday attachment. So now what I'm trying to explain you here is to whom we are sending the data because it is outbound EIB, correct? Outbound EIB itself means that I will be sending the data from workday to any third party. Now that third party has to disclose these details. What kind of server connections they are using? If they are using Amazon Simple Storage, how, how many of you know about S3? Amazon S3 bucket. Do you have any idea? Have you ever heard about it? Or have you ever used it? Anybody? S3, have you heard the name? Yes, no? No, no. Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. So only one person knows it. So do you, do you want to tell about it? What exactly is S3? As you have used it. Yeah, it's kind of a storage system where we can store our data, and yeah. uh, it has like it it can be accessible through these keys and access ID and secrets. Yes. So. Yeah. Okay, so let me add a few things. Suppose one of your clients or customer or vendor, whoever is requesting the data, they are using AWS. AWS is basically your Amazon Web Services. So in Amazon Web Service or AWS, the mechanism to store the data is basically called as S3, which is also called as Simple Storage Service. Okay, so that is provided by Amazon Web Services. Now, any data that you want to store, it will be dumped into S3 bucket. So why we call it as bucket? Because it contains a lot of information and you can, you can set it up in such a way that you can have lots of data in that. You know, you can have, basically the organizations use S3 to dump their data. You know, if they have to archive something, that also they'll put it in S3. Okay, so what happens here? If your client or vendor or the customer to whom you have to send the data, if they are using Amazon Web Service, then you have to select this option. Get the bucket ID. So bucket is something which they will know. We will not know about it, okay? Then once we have received that information, then we will come to know that in which area of the world their data center is located. So if you see Amazon Web Services servers are located in different parts of the globe. So you have US City, Ohio, North Virginia, California, Oregon, right? Then in, if, if you talk about APAC, you have Mumbai, Osaka, Seoul, Singapore, Sydney, Tokyo. Then you have one in Canada that is central. Right, then China, Nzixia, Frankfurt in UK, 
and there is one in Beijing. Okay, so this is all Europe, Frankfurt, Ireland, London, Paris, Stockholm, and then one in Brazil. So why is this distributed in such a way? This is distributed in such a way because the organizations have to be compliant as well. Now, compliant means what? Yeah, so let's say that um, some organization is expecting us to store the data in, in their region, specific region only, because of GDPR or some sort of uh, yes. policy they have. So right. then as for that, we have to select. So for the EU customer, we might have to choose one of the EU region. For mm -hmm. US, we might have to choose the US East or some like the their region. Let's say Indian government is saying, no, our data cannot go outside. Then we can choose the Mumbai region also. Correct. See, that is the most important part. So if you have to be a good or a compliant IT company, right? You have to follow the laws of the land. Laws of the land means wherever you're operating, your laws have to be followed. And as rightly stated, that uh, you know, if you are storing the data and the government is saying, no, I cannot allow you to take the data of my citizens outside of my country. So in that case, you have to store the data in that country itself. And that's the reason you have multiple data centers all across the globe so that their copy, you know, whatever the data they are storing, that is not made. I mean, the copy is not made and it stores it in the same server. Although these all servers are interconnected, guys, you know, but you can't breach and try to get the data from one system to the other uh, because there are several checks and, you know, firewalls are created in such a way that you will not be able to access those information, um, you know, from any other country. So that's the reason the number of data centers and servers have increased tremendously. And to access it, you need to have what? Your access key ID and a secret access key. So all these things are provided by whom? When you take the subscription of AWS and particularly S3 bucket, you will get this from Amazon and you will share with us considering that you are the customer who is going to use the data and I'm trying to send you that information through AWS and Workday. So that is how it is interconnected. Does that make sense? Or no, it's not clear till now. Then you have AS2. So this is another protocol, guys. This is a little more secure. Uh, why I'm saying it is more secure? Because if you see here, we have to actually put the endpoint. Now, do you all of you understand the meaning of endpoint? <clears throat> what is endpoint? Is there anybody who does not understand what is endpoint? Okay, considering that you all understand the endpoint. So whenever this AS2 is uh, used by any of the customer, so they give us that AS2 address. AS2 address is basically your AS2 endpoint. Now this endpoint tells us about the information. Now what information? That where exactly I have to send the data. That is the endpoint. Because my source is workday, my destination will be this endpoint if I'm using AS2. And then you have few IDs with which it is the data has to come. So it is like from ID now from which you are sending the data to ID to ID is basically to which customer you are sending it. Then there is a public key for encryption, private key for signature, public key for SSL and public key for SSL acceptance. Now all these make the data so much encrypted that if you don't have these keys, you will not be able to decrypt the data and look at what data has come. 
and that's the reason I said that this is little more secure than the other integrations. Okay, but this is very rarely used. I mean, in my career, I have just seen one customer using it up till now, and that was a bank. Okay, and uh, Apart from that, I have never seen anybody else using it. So this is very rare. You will not even see that in your day-to-day -day activity. But yes, in case you get it, you should be aware, like, you know, how exactly it works. Okay. So any, any questions, doubts on this AS2? Okay. Then I'll go to email. This is the most simple way of sending the data. What you need is to email address to whom you have to send the data. But the fact is you are sending it through integrations. Integration means you're sending it through EIB here. So that email address will always remain same. Okay. And from email address, that is, see what happens is whenever you have integration system right so you generally don't use your personal or your corporate email id here there is an integration user which gets created okay integration user which gets created and they have their email id so whenever you have such integrations where you actually need an id so that user the integration user or the dummy user which gets created that email IDs are used everywhere because that is configured to run all your integrations. Okay. Does that make sense to all of you? Yes. So will it pop populate automatically or do we have to put in? No, we have to put in. So from email address, we have to put in here. It's not like it will automatically pop up. Okay. So two is your customer then cc bcc and then from right and you have to put the subject but once you have done it like you know you need to configure it only once after that this integration you can schedule it it will keep on running and you know it will keep on using that link you don't have to worry about that so for the first time you have to do it next time onwards it will not ask you to perform any steps okay so this is your email now, how many of you actually understand FTP, SFTP, FTP, SSL? Have you used this before, anybody? Yeah. FTP? Yes. So, FTP, SFTP, um, these are the most common integrations path that you will get. Why? Because this is very easy to build, not a very high uh secure uh option but <clears throat> it has you know you, it is available very in, in a very low price okay this kind of addresses are available in a very low price and this is the most preferred type of connections okay so it is called as file transfer protocol and here you see it will ask you for the FTP address. So how exactly you have to type in, you know, how exactly you want to connect. Okay. So the FTP address starts with FTP. So here you see it will be in this format FTP colon forward slash forward slash, you know, the XXX. So basically here you have to put either the uh, IP addresses or you have to put the name of the FTP server, right? So that is where, you know, it becomes very much important. So let me search it now. Otherwise it is gone. Okay, I made a mistake. So this is the one, right? So I will go ahead and click on actions. Go to enterprise interface and edit. 
because this is not completed yet. We have to complete the delivery of it. Okay. Okay. So we were talking about FTP. So FTP, when we use it, right, you have to put that address in such a way that you have that as a, you know, uh, prefix like FTP colon forward slash forward slash and the address of it. And then you have the directory. Directory basically tells you that, you know, it's a kind of a folder where your data is going to be stored. If you're putting it into like, you know, C drive, D drive, whatever it is, you have to tell it. And the uh, path has to be put here. That is the meaning of your directory. And uh, with that, you would also need a username and password. Now, why do you need a username and password? Can anybody tell me? Authenticate. Yeah. So you are authenticating on a third party. You're trying to authenticate yourself on the third party system. Because when you're going to deliver the data, which means you have to enter their premise, which means your network and everything will be, you will be able to enter. And if you don't have a valid username and password, you, your system, the other system, the FTP system would not allow you to enter and it will kick you out. Okay. So for that purpose, user ID and password is required. So that is how FTP works. Any questions on this? Yes, no. If we don't provide the um, port, it just if we prefix it with FTP. Yeah. FTP and then you have the address here. Okay. That's it. And then comes FTP SSL. So SSL basically stands for a secure socket layer, guys. So whenever you have any network, uh, you know, where integration is used and you're using SSL connection, SSL basically means it's a secure connection. There is already a username and password associated with that earlier with the FTP, right? But here the additional layer of security is added through certificates. Do you know what is a certificate? How exactly it is used? Anybody? Yeah. Okay. Apart from you, uh, Ajitendra, is there any, anybody who is knowing? No the idea. No. No idea. Okay. Okay. So, guys, what happens when you are using any um, connections or you are building any connections to make it secure? A lot of providers, what they do is they add a extra secured layer, which is called as SSL. So what exactly is this? It is nothing but a simple certificate. Certificate basically means, uh, you know, it, it, it's something that will convert the data into a particular format. And once that connection is reaching the destination. The, raw, the job of that certificate is to make sure that the connection between the two endpoints are secure. If it is not secure, what will happen? It will start giving you an, you know, notification that your connection is not secure. So that you will see here also. Let me show it to you. So here you see it is HTTPS, right? S here stands for secure socket layer, SSL. So when I click on this, see, this says connection is secure. Why it is saying connection is secure? Because there is a certificate which is valid. So this kind of certificate gets attached. So here you see, you have workday.com organization. This was is huge to workday. Who was that? So there is a provider so that is called as geotrust tls rsa so what they do is they are the certificate provider um they are called as uh, i 
forgot the actual terminology right now but don't worry i'll tell it to you so they will uh, yeah so they are the global uh, certificate providers okay and in that case what they do whenever you have to build certain kind of connections and you want to make it secure then you have to get the certification from them and they are the uh, global providers they can provide it to anybody you just have to pay a fee and you'll get the request and the certificate once you have it you know it becomes very difficult for anybody to make the changes why because they encrypt the data using you know keys like sha1 and sha2 256 so if you see there is a expiry date also so june 2023 to july 2021 2024 okay so each year this has to be what revalidated okay so that the connections does not fail so that is how exactly it works so there are two types of uh, you know ssl in ftp implicit ssl and explicit ssl although these things have nothing to do with workday but i'm just trying to give you an additional knowledge so in this how exactly it works so i'll tell you ftps i colon forward slash forward slash this is how your address will be see ftps i or ftps e and then you have your ip addresses or whatever it is generally it is your ip address okay so you can use either si or se it does not matter but when you use this make sure you have a certificate in place otherwise you can't do that okay and again you have the user id and password that is mandatory okay so is that clear uh ftp ssl or no it's not clear you have not understood it is there a place where we import the certificate no we don't do that here because see this address is not our address right this is a third party address yeah i mean sometimes in some system i have seen that if you are calling to of course that was a part of https not ftps mm -hmm. i was thinking if we have to do it here also okay no that's not required okay so next is your https right so in this section if you see right it's asking you for a HTTP address. So for example, if I put this address, if you see, and put it here, it will not give me any error. Why? Because it has this HTTPS associated with it. Okay. And then there are multiple ways of authentication. So here you see web service invocation type. So I've got basic authentication no security oauth 2.0 web service user id password now oauth 2.0 was not there before it has recently been added in the last release okay so when you say basic authentication what happens here the user id and password you have to put okay if it is no security so it is just that certificate which is basically uh you know putting the effort of securing your data. Even your username and password is not mandatory. Then you have OAuth 2.0. Now this is called as open authentication, guys. Uh, so when you have OAuth 2.0, there is a OAuth provider. Okay. So what is this OAuth provider going to do? They are going to provide you access token, refresh token, refresh token URL, client ID and client secret. Now, what are these? So when I talk about access token, right? Access token basically helps you uh, connecting to the third party by generating some unique number, alphabets. You know, it's a combination of that. So OAuth 2.0 is basically called, basically called as open authentication. But when you have this OAuth 2.0, which is open authentication, there are few things, you know, if you see all of them are mandatory. 
So whenever you have to use OAuth 2.0, there is a OAuth provider. Now, when I say OAuth provider, which means um, there is one connection that that they have to tell you that what is going to be your access token because this access token can change also it is not that it will always remain the same and then you see this refresh token refresh token basically helps you get the fresh access uh, you know access token then from where this refresh token will come this is where your url has to be put then you have your client id and client secret that is all you know more like a uh, links so these are more like a website address that you have to put here client access sorry client id uh, client secret um, so these are basically your alphanumeric numbers and then in the token url you have to give us a url where you can generate the refresher url okay refresh token so these things make it very complex make it very secure but you will hardly see anybody using it but workday has given the facility if you want you can then you have web service user id and oh, password now this is more so in this when you use web service secure security user id and password it just has a username and password to attach to that that's it it's a simple like using any ftp or http nothing is that different from so yes, so now we are going into the web service. Oh, okay, that also we have discussed, right? So this was about HTTP. Then comes SFTP. SFTP and FTP, almost same. But what is their difference is the authentication method. So here also you will see the address is put in the such a way, like SFTP, and then you have the you know, IP addresses and everything like this. So here you see SFTP colon. This is how exactly it works. And then you have authentication method. So there are two ways. SSH, dual and username and password. So if you have dual authentication, right? So here you have the user ID, password, verify password. And then this is the one which needs to be uploaded, SSH authentication key pair. So this will be generated here. So whatever it is, you will have to generate it. This is where this needs to be uploaded into Workday system. It will not be something that you will get it directly. You will have to ask it from the client only. Then if you're using just the SSH, so for that you need the user ID and that key pair nothing more and if you're using username and password then in that case ssh is gone just the user id and password is required right is sftp also clear to everybody yep. okay then you see use existing delivery method now what does that mean so suppose we already have a <clears throat> integration already built within workday okay and that is using any existing protocol i can actually use them so that i don't have to rebuild the connections again and again suppose i already had one connection which was using s3 or aws so again i can get in and use that see that i can go ahead and use that connection so if i use it I don't have to build that connections again and again. So that is the use of using the existing delivery method. Okay, so I'm not going to use it at the moment, but I'm going to use this option which says workday attachment. Now, why I'm using workday attachment? The reason is, okay, so I'll just give the file name and I am getting that data in the form of CSV because if it comes in any other form, you know, it would not be easy for us to understand. So I'll try to get it in the CSV. That's the reason I have specifically mentioned the uh, extension .csv, okay? So why I'm using Workday attachment? The reason is <clears throat> when I run the integration, when I actually run the integration, 
I don't have a real time system where I can send the data and see whether it has reached or not. But to test it, Workday has given this option to use Workday attachment that you run the integration and get the output here itself. And you will see what data you are getting. So for that purpose, I'll go ahead and click on next and then click on OK. So my mechanism is completed. So first is your name ID. Then you have the get data from where you are getting the data. Then you have the transformation. Then you have the delivery. So once this is done, I'll go ahead and click on OK. All right, then what do you have? We go ahead and <clears throat> get into the integration system. We click on actions. And then we go to integration and we launch it. So here you see integration, organization and run frequency. I'll go ahead and click on OK. So it will ask me what is the file name you want to keep it same? Yes. Document retention policy. Yes. So document retention basically means that when you run the integration for how many days you want to keep this document. So I have kept one day and the maximum you can keep it is like six months that particular file. OK. So what will happen? This will complete and it will give me an output file here. So right now it is still processing. It got completed. Now I've got the output file. So here you see I got result.csv. So if I click on it, I'll get download it. So by default, you know, it opens in RTF because here it has been set it up in that way. So what I'll do, I'll go ahead and click on open with Excel. So you see, this is what I am getting and this is what you have in your report, right? Does that make sense? Right. This is how your data is actually sent into the third party system. And now you see it's very easy. If you have all the information details of the client, this is the most useful integration. The only drawback, the only drawback with this is you can only use one data source at one time, which means I can only have either a web service or a custom report and that data is going all at once. But suppose if I have to choose the data from multiple places, I can't do that. That's the only drawback of EIB. Otherwise, this is the most useful, the most easiest way of building an integration. And you see, I'm not used code anywhere, right? Does that make sense, guys? Web service or custom report, you said, no, there was this. So web, uh, the Custom report when it is a uh, web service enabled, that is only web service, right? Correct. That report becomes a web service. And where do we specify the retention policy? In the integration. Yeah. Okay, I'll go back. See. Okay, this is the process. I'll go back to the. Okay, this is the one. View integration system, right? So I'll yeah. edit it and I'll show it. I thought I already did. See, that is in the delivery section. Oh. Document retention policies. So right oh. now I've selected one. <laughs> Ideally, it is maximum is 180. <clears throat> so let's say I want to put it more like 181. See, the field document retention policy must have a value between 1 to 180. It cannot go oh. beyond 180 days. Oh. But I'll keep it one because this is a practice standard. I cannot go ahead and store it for permanently. Okay, so this is how your EIB works, guys. Is there any retry mechanism? Uh, yes. Uh, retry mechanism is how you can do it is you can re you know keep on scheduling. 
but if it fails just imagine if it fails so what will happen is you will have to manually do it or there's option in this it says minute reoccurrence so you can set this up so every minute it will try to send the data to the third party so this is the only way by which you can retry otherwise there is no other option okay and if it fails you will get a notification here in this bell icon that the integration that is running is not completed or has completed with this errors and this is how exactly it will look like can we customize this notification yes you can customize it how there is an option i will let you know basically in eib you may not be able to do but yeah in core connectors you can still do that okay okay all right so this is what we have in the outbound eib we have inbound eib still uh, pending so if outbound is clear right inbound is very easy inbound you will understand it just like that. Okay.